Golf is the, the only thing in golf that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the person playing. Is this man a one-time winner on the PGA Tour? The point, Alan, is he didn't go Hollywood. You need a fourth? Hello, this is Alan Shipnuck back for another Need a Fourth podcast in which myself, Michael Bamberger, and Jeff Ogilvie take turns surprising each other with a mystery guest. The other two co-hosts usually have no idea who this person is until we start taping. But on this occasion, the, the guest himself surprised us by jumping into our virtual hangout sooner than expected. Um, strangely, it was Ben Crenshaw who has no technical ability whatsoever. <laughs> Normally, doesn't even have a cell phone. But uh, somehow he got into our, our Zoom hangout b- before we could get there. So um, there's, there's no preamble. But before we get to a fascinating and life-affirming conversation with Gentle Ben, we do need to thank our, our sponsors, Echo Golf, who make this podcast possible. Michael, do you have something to say? Well, you, I think you know this about me, Alan, because you've known me well for a long time. I'm marketing resistant. Like, you can't tell what kind of sweater I'm wearing today because it's been blacked out. Much like Tiger with the ping man, you know, he's blacked that yes. thing out. But Echo, I can speak about authentically and naturally. And I want to ask you a question about Echo because I think you, you'll know where I'm going with this. Have you noticed with this Echo shoe, you put it on and there's no, quote, breaking in period? Have you oh, had that yeah. experience? I mean- Right out of the box. They are very cushy, very comfy, no blisters. The leather is supple. It just it just molds around your foot in an almost uh, sensual way. So, yes, I know what you're speaking of. Yeah. In fact, I had an experience with one of our other guests, Mike Mills, where he went to a golf course. I had forgotten one of his shoes. He had to go to the pro shop, buy shoes. He didn't buy Echo. And at the end of the day, he had terrible blisters. And we have never forgotten about that. But I don't think that ever happens with an Echo shirt. Not in my experience. No, no. It's a great product. We're happy to wear them, and we are pleased they're sponsoring this podcast. So without further ado, let's get to Nita Forth. Well, how are you, Ben? Where are you, Jeff? <laughs> I am sitting uh, next to the 14th hole on the West Coast at Royal Melbourne. Oh, you lucky dog, you. Oh, my gosh. That's still one of my favorite courses in the world. I really – I tuned in – a couple of weeks ago to watch Kingston Heath and Victoria. Uh, I happen to be, you know, as we have talked, an unabashed fan of, of the Australian courses, especially in the sand belt. There's nothing like the sand belt anywhere in the world. I still reckon that they're the most handsome bunkers I've ever seen in my life at, at Royal Melbourne, Kingston Heath. There's, simply because there's no sand like it anywhere on the face of the earth. Uh, but I, I just really enjoy it. I watch, I watch people play it. Having been there, it's really fun for me to watch. And I know they're, they're coming up with another one here pretty soon. What, what do they play, Jeff, within a week or two? We play a uh, – there's a Sandbelt Invitational Tournament. We play um, Kingston Heath, Royal Melbourne West, Yarra Yarra and Peninsula Kingswood North Course. Oh, I've seen Yarra Yarra, which is wonderful too. But God, they're just they're spectacular. They're spectacular. Jeff was talking about the sand in the sand belt is very angular and therefore it can compact in a unique way. And that's how they can cut those sharp edges of the bunkers, which kind of blew my mind. Like I always, I never thought about the different properties of sand. I would like to hear you guys talk for 30 minutes about different sands and how it's affected your lives as designers. Cause that's incredible to me. Well, I, I can just tell you the first time I saw Royal Melbourne, um, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, and uh, actually, the first course that I played in Australia was Metropolitan Metro, which was wonderful, just wonderful golf course. But uh, I went over to Royal Melbourne, and I, I, the size and the scope, and uh, I, I'd just say they're magnificent bunkers. They're meaningful they, they're they bold. But yes, uh, I don't think there's any sand like it on the face of the earth. One of the very few places, like you mentioned, that there's no collars on the greens. They just roll up, they just edge right into the bunkers, which is a unbelievable contrast. And 
when you're standing out there trying to hit an approach shot to any of those greens, it's very vivid, uh, and it's a, it's a uh, it does mark where you're trying to go. But I think the size and the proportion and the different ways that uh, uh, that really McKenzie and Alex Russell. Alex Russell to me is maybe one of the unsung heroes of golf architecture anywhere in the world. What a what a craftsman he was. Uh, and I really do count myself very lucky to have spent a couple of hours with Claude Crockford, too, who was the old greenkeeper at Royal Melbourne. And I'll never forget a couple of things that he said. He, he stunned me with this one. He said, he said, you know, you in America try to grow grass. He said, we try to keep it from growing over here. And I, <laughs> that just, it has a, sort of an insight as to uh, his expertise and a craftsman. You know, he grew up bowling. He grew up building bowling greens in, the, in, in Melbourne. And uh, it was, but the way that they keep golf courses and the way that their agronomy standards are as high as anywhere in the world. Uh, he described the process of how, you know, every three or four years they re-turf uh, uh, the grass. And he v definitely believed that compaction uh, was the bane of all diseases. Uh, I just don't think that I was ever around anyone who was that learned and, and uh, he was so avid in his principles. Uh, and I'll, I'll never forget this too. One day I played with Greg Norman at Royal Melbourne in 1988. Uh, it was a very, very hot day. And the wind was blowing hot uh, from the north. It was about 100 degrees, about 10% humidity. I got through and I went, God, I just want to see what the crew does out here. The place looked like it was going to be on fire. And a small crew went out with a handheld hose and spent about two minutes on each green. And then they left. And I said, well, that, that's unbelievable. Uh, but it's when you talk about firm conditions anywhere in the world, I mean, you have links in the UK. Uh, when you've had a drought, uh, but to me, uh, I was treated so many times in Melbourne to to play on firm, firm surfaces. Uh, so healthy, so healthy. Think about that a lot. But there's no no other place that you can do it though. <laughs> Jeff, have you ever had a chance to play uh, Ben's Course Sand Hills in Nebraska? I haven't been to Sand Hills, no. Um, unfortunately, it's been on the wish list for a while, but it's so hard to get to. Um, <laughs> oh, God. And when you do what we do, like, I mean, I'm sure Ben can relate to this in the playing days. When you do what we do, and you love golf courses, all you want to do is play the great ones. But when you play an average one Tuesday through Sunday every week, it's just hard to sort of roll out on Monday and go somewhere special because you got to go play the next six days somewhere that you don't really probably love you know what i mean it, you get a bit jaded and you never really the tour doesn't go to fun places you know we don't go to westchester county very often anymore and i mean we do go to carmel which is pretty good um <laughs> we don't go to nebraska you know um yeah so i I haven't been to Sand Hills, no, but I've played. I've I've been Ben. Give me a little tour of his place, Austin Golf Club, which was um, really cool. And I've always loved his. Him and him and Bill's courses have just such a. Well, like he was talking about Royal Melbourne, they have. It's a subtle. It's a nuance. It's it's quite. Uh, you have to go find the golf course. You know, you have to find where the intelligence is in it. And I think it's one of those. They're always courses that you want to play again. You know, I think which is probably the ultimate compliment of an architect to me if, if anyone had ever played any of our courses they just say when they finish 18 they just want to go out and play again and i think oh well we've done a decent job here you know because my favorite courses i don't know i mean you read golf magazine or golf digest and they have this list of how they rank courses and it's shot values and 
all the I don't know all the junk that they just talk about. I don't understand, but to me, it's um, if I want to go play again, and the one that's pulling me to the first tee the hardest is my favourite. You know, um, and I think that's sometimes indescribable. But I think Bill and Ben's courses generally do that to me. Well, Jeff, you're you're right at right at the peak where where you are. I can tell you this. You know, I. I <laughs> I have to tell you all a story. Uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to win tournaments and I've had pressure putts. Jeff will appreciate this. In 1988, we played the World Cup at Royal Melbourne. And uh, Mark McCumber was my partner. We were coming down the last few holes and we were a very almost tied with the Ozaki brothers from Japan. And Julie, we had just had our first child who was in Hawaii. And we were going to finish, finish the tournament and go back over to Hawaii. Catherine was uh, two months old. We come down to the last hole, and I have to make this eight-footer downhill for us to win. And Julie told me before that putt, she said, look, I've been away from that baby for two weeks. You better make that putt. <laughs> before I was I've, got, I've got this, you know, eight feet down on ice. And somehow I got it in, but that's one of the pressure pots I ever had. And I was so proud to have won at Royal Melbourne, but God, I'll never forget that. Julie and I laugh at that. And I said, Julie, you were really tough on me. I said, God, you don't know how d- difficult that putt was. But, you know, a- as an aside, I-, I love to talk to anybody who can handle wing foot in the U.S. Open. How about that? <laughs> Yeah, I'll never watch. I'll never forget watching Jeff playing there. He played beautifully. Played bold when he had to. That's you know anybody who has been around wing foot and played it in competition. It is difficult, very difficult. And he handled them. And I'm very proud of him for doing that. He carried it off in great fashion. Yeah, wing foot's tough. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> I don't play it every week. I'm not sure I'd still play golf if I played it every week, but. It's such a treat. Um, I was back there this summer, actually, uh, for the first time for a few years, and every single time it blow, the greens blow me away. You could have no rough around there and the place would be really difficult, you know. Um, there's not too many places like, I mean, I grew up around Royal Melbourne and the sand belt that the greens are so important and where you are around the greens. Wingfoot, if you're in the wrong spot around the greens, I don't care who you are. Seve's not getting it up and down. You know, um, but if you're in the right spot, it's relatively sort of doable. But it's finding the right spot's really hard. It's just incredible. And I don't know about you, Ben, but I feel like if if we built wingfoot greens now, they'd run us out of the business and they'd never give us another job again. Yet they might be my they might be my favourite greens. I know with the, with those contours, they'd be unmanageable, especially green speeds these days. Uh, superintendents you know have and they don't have contests between each other but they're very proud of of what they can do uh but you're right you, you study the formations and the swings and the borrows on those greens uh wow they're they're pretty fierce they don't need to get up uh when they're a tournament oh gosh it's it magnifies your errors a lot <laughs> How do you guys feel about the new back tee? All three of you, how do you feel about, uh, uh, we haven't seen it yet, but just the idea of a new back tee on, on 13 at Augusta National? This is the way golf's gone. And it's, it's uh, Augusta National has tried very hard to stay ahead of, uh, of things. Uh, I, I can't, I think there were, what, maybe two players in the last three years who could carry the ball over those trees across the corner which is unfathomable in itself. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I've just seen a picture of it. I haven't seen it in person. But it, you can't get out of there. You've got to go, uh, you've got to go straight. And then, and then maybe hopefully a little turn. But I, it's, I, I'm going to get back there, I guess, in April and, and look at it <laughs> and, and say I'm very happy I don't have to look at that. But, <laughs> Uh, it's uh, the club has tried very hard to uh, challenge players these days. That's very difficult to do. 
uh, I never thought that I'd see a day where well over half the field can carry the ball 300 yards. Uh, and it, and it uh, I know they've tried very hard to keep in the situation where your approach shots, people play the same clubs that they did a long time ago. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's possible these days, but and especially if you have dry conditions, the ball is going to keep running. Uh, but uh, it, it will be interesting to see. But then again, Jeff knows you've got to get up and tackle those greens, get into the greens and position yourself. It's very difficult. Uh, you have shots there, especially the little shots. I don't know about you, Jeff, the little shots at Augusta are, it always seemed to me that you could practice all the little practice shots you wanted to, but in the tournament itself, you get up to your ball and you say, God, I've never had this shot before. <laughs> so you have to have to imagine it and have to feel it. It's a little bit like Royal Melbourne. You know, you just you can practice there as long as you want, but you never seem to have the same shots. So <laughs> imagination and touch. Ben, when you played your first Masters in 1972, what clubs would you have been hitting in a 13? Can you remember? Oh, yeah. I hit uh, many, many drive and three and four woods. You know, if you hit a good one uh, off the tee uh, with a little bit of turn, a little bit of dangerous turn to the left, that's what you were trying to do, uh, no question. But uh, uh, you think about that whole, so many momentous decisions that were made there. Uh you know, it comes in the in the round where if you do try it and you and you fail, it comes early enough in your round, it sticks with you to the end of the day. And you say to yourself, well, should I have tried that? Or if you bring it off, it gives you ex, ex, extra confidence as well. Uh, but uh, then you have to try to two-putt number 14, which is hard enough. Uh, but no – 13 and 15 have always been a great part of that place, always will be. Uh, so many exciting things have happened. Uh, but, no, it played longer in those days, no question. But, uh, you know, you with a, a persimmon club and a lot of ball, you, you could only drive so far. Jeff, as a, as a golf course architect yourself, how, how would if you were presented with the question of what do we do on 13, what, what do you think you, you might have said? Oof, I don't know. Like Ben says, it's kind of – it's where golf's at. Um, in one sense, it's a shame, I think, because there's something nice about – well, there's two sides. There. There's something nice about we still play the same game that Jones did, but we don't, you know. Um we're still playing the same courses. The, the beauty of the Masters is we go to this beautiful place every single year. Almost indefinitely it's been, and you just you get to see every generation play these same holes. It's it's nice that we do that. And it's a little bit of a shame that we have to change it, but we do have to change it. And you want to see you don't want to see if there's two or three going over the trees now from the what's been the current T, there's gonna be twenty five going over the trees in a few years' time. And that's taking all the fun away from that hole because the fun, as Ben said, I mean, it's a relatively simple hole if you hit two great shots. It's just really difficult to hit those two great shots, you know, and you've got to, you've really got to risk your tournament a little bit to make three there. You've got to take the water on on the left and you've got to off the tee and you've got to take the water on on the right off the second shot. It's almost the perfect hole. Um, and it's unbelievably far back, that picture I've seen where that, T is like Ben says. I'm pretty glad I don't have to play it right now. Um, but you know what? Every time, at least in my era, Augusta was the change era, the big change era. I know it's always evolving and it's always been changing, but it, it gained a lot of length in the last 20 years. Um, every time we'd get there, it's like, oh, this is too long. Like seven. Everyone when they put the tee back on, seven, everyone was complaining and moaning. We can't hit three irons into this green. This is ridiculous. Everyone's hitting wedge in again. Like they got it right. We all thought they were wrong, but they were right. They're ahead of the curve almost every time. So um, it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure it'll play really long and there'll be a bit, a little bit of moaning. I mean, players are very careful about moaning at the Masters because they want to come back. Um, but 
in, in a few years' time, I'm sure it'll be right. They haven't really missed the mark very often there. Um and it kind of needs to happen. It's great. It would be great to see the whole field having to hit three iron or five wood or something from with the ball way above their feet and take that shot on. It's a much more difficult decision than it is with a six iron um, or even a nine iron or some of these kids hit in there now. Uh, so, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a slight shame, but it's where golf is. And I, it's such a great hole that it'll be, it'll be fine and it'll still be one of the best holes in the world. And the boys are just going to have to work it out in Monday to Thursday they're just going to have to work out what they want to do and how much they want to take on and uh, and someday hopefully we get the two leaders standing there with a three iron and a five wood in their hand like Faldo did in 96 and deciding which one do I hit which one do I hit and standing there for three minutes because that's really why the Masters I think <laughs> is so compelling to watch is because it makes players make decisions they don't want to make but you have to make them you know it forces you to go for 13 when you really don't want to. That's a really hard <laughs> shot when you've got a long club, but you have to go because you can just tell that Costas or someone's up in the tower. <laughs> it goad, goads you into taking a chance, you know, and it's, yeah, you know, the, the targets are wide enough and it's inviting, you know, that shot is downhill and you have to figure that in. Well, you know, you're going, the ball's going to travel a little further downhill. It's very difficult, of course, but, you know, I knew things were changing a good while ago when the new 17th tee at St. Andrews was back over the road and onto the new course. I said, wow, the things are changing. <laughs> so, you know, it's holds like that. It, like you say, Jeff, yes, change, but you had to. Uh, in, in the hands of, of these great, great players, I'm, I'm having the best time watching so many great players these days. It's the quality of golf. Yes, it's a power game, uh, but it, it's 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 wonderful to see the skills come out at different times with all these guys, all these young guys who are trying to climb the ladder. Uh, they, you can see where they. A lot of it sometimes is where people have come from. I always reckon that people from Australia and people from South Africa could really play the game because of where they grew up. Uh, it can handle breezy conditions, uh, hot conditions, and uh, very adaptable. So uh, I, th- I enjoyed meeting different people from across the world and where they grew up and how they played. Alan, how about for you as someone who's written a lot of memorable game stories from Augusta? What, what would you, if you, if Fred Ridley called you and said, what, what should we do on 13? What would you tell him? I'm not expecting that phone call, but um, <laughs> I would enjoy it. Um, <laughs> it. It's funny you mentioned that, that foul to a three iron, Jeff, because I've, I've been lucky to witness a lot of amazing shots and pressure situations of the majors. And I was standing right there on that rope line when Faldo was standing out there in that fairway and framed by the trees and the beautiful afternoon light. And, you know, people always talk about the sound of, of uh, a strike at impact and it, it can be a little mythologized, but I can still hear that strike and the way that ball just rifled through the air like, before you even land on the green. I was like, uh, Greg's cooked. I mean, it was probably the most pure golf shot I've ever seen with my own two eyes. And um, so that that's just a funny memory I have. And um, yeah, I would I would tell Fred, I understand why they pushed it so far back. They don't, they don't want to have to go back again in five years. Like they obviously tipped it out. I, I hopefully they will they will bring the tee forward. You just you want almost every player in the field to have to make that decision. And if if they put it too far back and and ha- it's an automatic layup for half or two thirds of the field. It takes a lot of the romance out of that hole. And um, so finding the right mix, testing the longest players, but also letting the Zach Johnsons or someone like that at least think about it. Zach's a bad example because he laid up every time. But, you know, the um, it would be – I think it would be a shame if, if it's just – if it becomes a, a thoughtless hole where um, so many guys just don't even – they hit it. They know they're not going to go for it, so they hit a three wood or a five wood off the tee just to make sure they, they put it in the fairway. They hit another, they knock it up there with a five iron, and then it just becomes you know basically a hundred yard par three. Like none of us want that. So, um, err on the side of, of of keeping the drama and the uh, the excitement. But I think they know that instinctively. 
it's just difficult. You know, I know that Jeff, uh, when he thinks about building the course, you want to try to reach everybody that you can. You want to bring variety. We always tried to get a par five that you could reach and then one that you couldn't just for variety's sake. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, the the nature of the par fives at Augusta are such that on certain days you can get there on all of them. Although eight's a little difficult going uphill, but uh, the the temptation with the, with the water on the back nine and and the way it starts to climax is it just doesn't happen that often in, in such a beautiful place and it's uh, I've always said the acoustics uh, of playing that golf course in the tournament have a lot to do with it. If there's no place that sound means quite a lot. You always know where you are. You always know who did what by the decibels of the yells. Uh, it just makes you excited. Uh, this doesn't happen that in the world of golf that often. Um, you know, both of you guys are obviously uh, golf romantics, Michael as well. But for 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 Jeff and Ben, uh, when you go to a course that that in your playing days it, that you just don't love, it just, it doesn't stir the soul. It probably has the, the initials TPC in it, maybe not, but it's just <laughs> n- not a a a wondrous piece of architecture. It's just a golf course, and like you like you said, Jeff, you got to slog through the practice rounds, the pro am, the tournament rounds. How do you set aside your own tastes and your own mental health so you can focus on the job at hand, which is to make a lot of birdies? Like when you're essentially offended by the architecture, like how challenging is that for the two of you in particular? Uh, I I didn't struggle too much. There's enough to worry about when you play golf. You know, like how am I hitting it? What am I What am I swinging it like this week? How's my putting? How's my chipping? Um, working on something here and there. So I think most of a pro golf, I don't know how Ben was, most of a pro golf's, uh, golfer's headspace is filled up with how am I going to hit it better tomorrow or how am I going to hold more putts tomorrow. I think it's a bonus when you get to play an inspiring golf course, I think. Um, and you're just used to it. The PGA Tour is, I guess, I mean, the, to its benefit and its detriment, is very good at setting up stuff very similarly every week. Um so you kind of know what you're going to get before you get there. And it's about how do I shoot the lower score around this course that I can? I mean, it's a lot more fun, obviously, at Augusta or the old course or Riviera or Royal Melbourne or because um, there's a more more depth and more nuance to the sport rather than just hit it straight and go find it and hit it straight again. Um, but I don't know. I think it's the job. It, it, I mean, I th- I fell in love with golf courses slowly over time, great architecture. I think, I mean, I grew up on the sand belt, so I didn't believe everybody when they said, well, your courses are some of the best in the world, like <laughs> until I went away. I thought, what do you mean? They're just, over, this, it's just around the court. What do you mean? They're, they're, all golf courses are like this, you know? And it was just gradually over time that I realized, wow, it took me a long time to work out that I'd grown up around such incredible golf courses. Um that most of the time I was just focused on how do I hit the ball better or further or I can't fade it at the moment. What am I doing? Um, it was more game focused than course focused. And I think the golf course stuff came gradually. I mean, every now and then there was an, the offensive setups, there was this period early in my career and it's probably been, it's come and gone over the years. It seems to have gone for now, which is nice. Just the hack out rough. When you hit it off the tee and you knew you just pulled sand iron out, as soon as you hit it in the rough, you'd walk up the fairway with your sand iron because it's the only club you were ever going to hit for your second shot because you were in the rough. That really drove me nuts. And I had trouble going 72 holes, keeping my head in a good space when that was happening because I think recovery is the some of the beauty of golf is that it's getting yourself out of the problem you get yourself into. Um, and if the best courses and the best, our favorite golfers ever have been masters at doing that. Um, it frustrated me a lot when it was just, you hit it the rough and you just have to hack it out and try to get it up and down for par. That was boring to me and that annoyed me. But most of the time, the challenge of actually playing the game was enough 
you know, and it was just cream on top if it was a great cause. I agree with Jeff. I mean, the hardest circumstances to play, at least in my career, was playing the U.S. Open, where it seemed like 25, 30 years in a row, you, you knew exactly what the setup was going to be. It was very ironclad, uh, 36, 37 yards wide or, or approaching 40 in cer- certain circumstances, but the rough was brutal on both sides. And you just, it was very penal, but you knew what was going to happen. And it was very frustrating. Like Jeff said, there's, you know, you hit the ball in the rough. There's only one thing to do is hack it out and try to get it up and down somehow. But that's the way it was. Brutally tough. Uh, uh, fearsome because you knew what was the whole week was going to be that way. So, Put the no question the emphasis on the straight drivers. Uh, very tough to do on, on a lot of golf courses, but it was very consistent. Uh, I think our uh, PJ Boatwright from the USGA set up the courses many, many years. You knew exactly what you were going to get. Uh, things changed a little bit later, uh, probably for the better, uh, but it was, you knew what was going to happen. And a lot of other major tournaments uh, went that way too. The PGA uh, of America went many years with uh, same setups, uh, but I, I, a little bit like Jeff said. Sometimes it's not the true revealer of a golf course and its makeup. Uh, I was lucky uh, to when I started traveling as an amateur through college. I would go seek out a golf course that I'd heard about and I'd go visit it and look at it. And it really kind of, uh, that was my thesis, uh, in, in architecture. Started seeing different places, see how things worked, see what, uh, people were talking about. They'd say, wait, do you see this green? Wait, do you see this hole? You know, and things like that. So, uh, you know, in Jeff's case, <laughs> you could grow up right right next to some of the best courses in the world. I have to chuckle at that. It must be unbelievable. You grow up around there and everything else is a come down. <laughs> it, I've never seen anything like it, though, when I went through the first time. I said, God, this is completely fantastic. No, it's unbelievable. I, 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 Because you don't believe it when everybody tells you. you. You live next to the best course in the world. And the one next door, that's that's <laughs> one as well. And then the one just a, two miles down the road is as well. It's like, there's no way. Like, we don't have the best stuff in Australia. And it's not until you go somewhere else to realize that. You almost have to go away. It's like The Alchemist, that, that great book. You have to go away to realize that it's all right in front of you, you know. Um, yeah, it was incredible. So spoiled, amazing. So I, most people start at some local muni that they haven't raked the bunkers since 1989 and um, there's, there's not much going on there and it's pretty poor and they go up and they fantasize about playing at these great golf courses and eventually one day after 30 years of golf, they get to go play somewhere fantastic. I, I was the other way around, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is an interesting way to do it. <laughs> now, people, people can see it on television, but unless you're there, you just you can't comprehend how how – the wonders it is. And, and like I say, in the hands of, of uh, great architects and people who take care of them and know what they're doing, it's just very unique. Ben, you may, uh, you may know that uh, Jeff is doing work at uh, Medina. Uh, Jeff, you are too young to remember, but I am not. Uh, how well Ben played at the 1975 U.S. Open at Medina. He was a shot out of the uh, Lou Graham, John Mahaffey playoff. Do I have that exactly. right? You're, you're exactly right. You, and, uh, I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what happened? The uh, the seventeenth hole there, and and the way that the it's actually the thirteenth hole now. The seventeenth, very long par three over the water, and I hit this two iron, and I hit it in the toe, and 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 rinsed it before the green. That was my double bogey, and then I lost. I, I got, I missed the playoff by one, but uh, it was right there before me. But I didn't execute. Painful, painful uh, two iron. Uh, uh, 
that was my best open finish, U.S. Open finish. But, uh, yeah, Lou Graham, Lou Graham and John Mahaffey. But uh, I'm glad you're working at Medina. It's a that spectacular place. Some wonderful holes there, stately trees, uh, and some good strong holes. My gosh, lots of good holes. And, you know, in Chicago, in the summer, you have to deal with the breeze. You have to play in the wind in Chicago. Uh, probably in Jeff's case, he'll probably cut down a few trees and make the wind make the wind sing through those trees. But uh, he's got a wonderful place to work with. Medina has been uh, one of our great courses and great membership, very proud memberships there. Yeah, it's very exciting for us. It's uh yeah, as you said, it's an incredible property. It's very grand. Just driving in, you feel it feels very big and special. And like you said, proud membership, very engaged in the club. And yeah, we're privileged to get a chance. So yeah, it's going to be fun. It's a great place. It's sorry, it's had so. There's not many courses. It's in it's in that short list of clubs that have had all the biggest tournaments in the US. You know, it's had US Opens and Ryder Cups and PGA's, tour events and um for, for and a really interesting there's a reason for that isn't it Jeff? <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely it's uh it's got a scale and a feel that's just yeah it's a pretty special place so it's going to be it's going to be fun hopefully we hopefully we do a nice job <laughs> i mean in, in job like that of uh, jeff how how much latitude do you have can can you're probably not going to reroute it, but is it just just to take what's there and and make it a little spiffier, or are, do you have the freedom to really reimagine some of the holes and and you know because this place does have a history and a pedigree? So how does that constrain you? Um, well, it's interesting. Um, sometimes when we work in Australia, um we have to go through seven different committees and boards and 12 different member meetings to be able to move a bunker, you know? Um, but in the U S we've found generally that, uh, very often it's like, well, you guys are the experts. You tell us, you know? And if we sort of, if we suggest something bold, they'll think about it and go, yeah, that's great. Do it. And if, um, we don't, they'll be disappointed that we didn't suggest something bold. You know, so I mean, it's not Medina is so great. The bones of it are so great, and the land is so great um, that there's going to be some, mostly just polishing the diamond, really, and sort of. I mean, courses change. I mean, trees grow and greens deteriorate and bunkers deteriorate and cutting lines move. You know, like you take photos are fantastic, and Medina's got this great sort of archives of photos over the years and you can see how much golf courses move without them trying to make them move over time. I mean, it's an organism. Um, and the guy cutting the greens cut the greens in 1987, but then a new guy cut them and he sort of cut them in a little bit of a different place. And the, the bunkers, the sand splash out of the bunkers, the, some of the bunkers get bigger and smaller and it moves. So a lot of it is sort of going, picking through all of that and sort of where were the best versions of these holes over the years. And, um, trying to sort of have some historical sort of a nod to history and and, and when the second or the third or the eighth or the twelfth or when it was at its best state, you know, um, having a look at that and can we sort of find that again Um, and just get back to the best version of the golf course that it can be. And sometimes that might be moving a green or, um, moving a hole and sometimes the hole's in the perfect place and you might just have to rebuild the bunkers for function, you know. Um, so we're a little bold on the plan in spots, but we're um, generally sort of pretty, as I said, sympathetic to the, the history. It's got a really interesting history. It was really hard to find which architects had ever been there. It's a really sort of checkered history. They've had a lot of people come do what we're doing in the last 100 years at Medina. Um, so combing through the boys, Michael and Ashley are fantastic at finding the, they found pictures and evidence of architects going there that the club didn't even know, which was kind of fun. Yeah. Oh, nice. So yeah, really, really cool stuff. If you can have 
access to good archives and you really see what has happened through the years. It's such a help, as you know. Uh, and like you say, bunker edge changes, um, putting green sizes change through the years with agronomy and this and that. But uh, it, like you say, if you have a good set of archives, you, you just know. And you talk to the older members and this and that, and you rely on them. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah, we've loved it. If I if you had any advice, I think you'd probably agree, Ben. If anyone who had a golf course, you just take photos all the time and put them in the archives, you know, and get testimonials from members and just just record everything because over the years, um, the clubs where you go to where they don't have any evidence of what was there before, it's kind of disappointing and you have to decipher it, which is kind of fun, but it's fantastic when you've got the records, especially of such an old place like Madonna because um, – it's it's just interesting. Anyway, if you're into golf courses, it's just fantastic to read about how people, they used to play the tee from over there. Can you believe that? I mean, there might be a stand of 100-foot trees there, but the tee used to be over there, you know, and you go stand there, it's like, wow, it would have been a better hole from here. But we can't move 1,700-foot oak trees, so we better go back to the time. This I just find that stuff really, really interesting. Um, it's like an archaeological dig in a way sort of digging through the history of a course, especially a course like Madonna that's had so many sort of so many hands touch it. You know, it's really a, a combination of a lot of people over the years sort of putting their touch on it and changes here and then changing it back because we didn't like that 20 years later. And um, we had a really interesting thing at Shady Oaks. I'm sure they'd be they'd be fine about telling us there was at one point the 18th that Shady sort of goes over a hill and at one point uh, Mr. Hogan had put a bunker in, I think, on the right-hand side of the fairway. Ben might even remember the bunker. I don't know when it was there. but um, And it was over the hill. It was a bunker that was sort of blind. You couldn't see it um, and it turned out to be an awful bunker. I don't know how long it was there for and they filled it in and I think they were telling uh, – someone mentioned to Mr. Hogan, remember that bunker that you put down on the right-hand side of the 18th? There was never a bunker on the right-hand side of the 18th. <laughs> 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 he erased it from the hole and he erased it from history just by denying that he'd ever put one there. So those sort of things are just fantastic. I just love that stuff about golf and um, golf courses and, yeah, the, the archives are brilliant. God, that God. You can't believe this. Uh, I was – thinking the other night that in two successive nights in Fort Worth, I had dinner with Mr. Hogan and his wife and Byron Nelson and his wife on two successive nights, <laughs> which was, I'll never forget that as long as I live. They were two different people. They had a lot of respect for each other. And oddly enough, they grew, grew up in the same town, the same caddy yard, uh, but I was lucky enough to have known them both, cherished my friendships with both, and uh, I, I don't know how many people would would have ever had dinner <laughs> two successive nights with with those two. Uh, God, I think about what they accomplished in the game and how how much that people looked up to them both. It's uh, quite remarkable so i'm very lucky what's your best hogan story <laughs> he he came out when i played this was really funny i played a, my round at colonial in the morning it was a very hot day and i went out to shady oaks i was going to hit some balls in the afternoon and um i was i i, I was not playing well and so i went out and, and uh the little nine is what they call it. I mean, that's where Mr. Hogan practiced. So I went out there and I was hitting balls. And he came over. Here he comes over in his cart. And he said, all right, let me see you've hit a few. So I did. And I wasn't hitting them well at all. Left, right, every which way. And he, he looked at me. He said, well, what did you shoot today? And I said, well, I shot 65. And he did not want to hear anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, he watched me a couple more shots and he just took off. He said, well, good luck to you, fella. And he just drove off. <laughs> <laughs> he, he always kind of teased me because <clears throat> I knew Jackie Burt and Jimmy DeMerit very well. And he loved talking about those two. 
But uh, no, I, uh, I had some clubs made, and he always teased me. Uh, but uh, Byron was was a very he's like a grandfather, you know, very very different. Uh, he'd always try to help, but uh, to no avail in both both counts. But I knew them both. Uh, cherish those times. I'm terribly sorry to break into this episode of Need a Fourth because it's it's so much fun to listen to, to Ben Crenshaw opine on so many things. But we do want to tip our cap to our very generous corporate sponsors, Link Soul. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the clothing they make. I've been wearing it for a super long time. Definitely predates their alignment with this podcast. This is an authentic testimonial. I do love their clothes. Um, and we're doing kind of a fun little giveaway if you go to the Fire Pits Instagram handle, you have to follow us and you have to comment on this episode. It shouldn't be hard. There's been a lot of thought-provoking topics. And that will make you eligible for this gift card, which we will reveal in a very splashy public way. And you could uh, get some cool clothing on us. So thanks for supporting Link Soul. Thanks for listening to Need a Fourth. Now back to Mr. Ben Crenshaw. Uh, ben, this is a nutty question. This is for all three of you guys. I um Ben, you've played courses that don't have – well, Jeff made a funny reference earlier to uh, uh, municipal courses that hadn't had bunkers raked since the late 80s. How would you feel, Ben, about golf courses not having uh, uh, rakes and bunkers? Well, um, you know, it's – it's some places cannot possess the tools to keep courses like that. So it's what they have to do. But you finally say, well, this is a golf course and, and people, this is a place where it's not possible. You, so you play it. That's how people learn. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's something that's not always possible. It's, it's, listen, as much as I love Augusta National, it's the only place in the world where you're going to get uh, agronomy like that and people are enamored with it. Yes. The people at home always have got to wonder why, why we can't do that. Well, it's not possible, you know. So when you when you grow up in certain circumstances, and uh, Jeff and I uh, have known players that have come from, let's say, unkempt golf courses, they learn how to play, and they they they're very adaptive. Uh, their experiences are different, but you you come to admire those those guys and gals who have, who have done that. Uh, part of it's part of your learning process. So uh, it can't be graceful all the time. It just can't be. It's not not possible. Nature doesn't work that way. I like the idea of the Peter Peter Thompson always say he used to yell at us. It's like don't rake bunkers. It's a hazard. Don't, just don't hit it in there. You guys don't don't know what a tough bunker shot is. Um, I think if we play, it's a symptom of 72-hole stroke play becoming the the only form of the game, don't you think? I think if we played match play all the time and golf had gone the match play route, like tennis, say, um, you could not rate bunkers and it would be fine because it's just you against your opponent in that group and the better player would generally win and you don't have to protect the field and... Um, but you play seven, you've got 156 guys playing the same course. It kind of, and we're playing for so much money and it's so important. Uh, you really have to give everyone the same playing field as, as much as you can, I think. Um, but I love the idea of the adventure. And when you're a kid, it's funny. I remember being the younger I was, I would grab, I just wanted to hit the hardest shot possible. Like I would go to the bad lie in the bunker. Before I, I wouldn't tee it up. Now all I want to do is put it on a good lie to make myself look good, you know, and hit a good shot. But when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was the hard shot. And that's the the adventure that sort of maybe has been lost a little bit of golf because we're, we're all too enamored with a perfect golf shot that we forgot that the whole point of this is just going out into the backyard and having an adventure, you know, creating your own stuff. And I think not raking bunkers, that's part of that. So I think... Uh, I'm on both sides. You can't really do it in practical terms. And plus, if you don't rake bunkers ever, then they don't work very well. You know, they you need to rake them to keep them operating properly and being good bunkers. But I like the idea of bad lies in bunkers. I just think it's not practically fair. And Jeff, it reminds me of a story that I read 
you know, when they furrowed the bunkers at Oakmont, and that those those were the most fearsome bunkers ever, and and you know, you just couldn't hit the ball out of them. And I'll never forget that I was reading where Jimmy Demerit was in a bunker on the 13th hole and came kind of close to the clubhouse at Oakmont. These sports writers came out and they said, well, what do you think about these bunkers, Jimmy? He said, well, if we'd have had these rakes in the Second World War, he said, Rommel never would have made it past Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> Might be the greatest quote ever in golf. <laughs> I've heard that one. I love that so much. <laughs> It kind of gives you an inter- interesting idea about Jimmy Demerit, but uh, I think in Charlie McDonald's book, he's, he wasn't uh, above r- running horses through bunkers. So it really meant for you to stay out of bunkers somehow. So those those are pretty wild, but that's that's people have mentioned that. Uh, but you're right, and Jeff, I mean, a lot of tournaments that we have played for so many years. You have perfect lives and bunkers, and these guys become really adept at scoring uh, because they have wonderful sand with which to play. So, yeah, it was different uh, a long time ago, a little more natural, let's say, in yesteryear. (laughs) But you remember Jack maybe seven years ago at the Memorial? He did. He tried to fur. (laughs) <laughs> he furrowed the bunkers, and the players hated it. They mutinied. <laughs> they mutinied. It was miserable. It was impossible because <laughs> he would do it. I mean, the furrows are bad enough, but he would do it sort of perpendicular to the line of play, not parallel. So you you just had zero chance, right? Um, which I don't like either because if you don't want to, it's like the bat. It's like the hack out rough. Golf is more interesting when you've got hope. When you hit it into a bunker off the tee, and you're like, "Oh, I hope I've got, I hope I can get it on the green. I hope I can get it on the green." Oh, there's a chance, right? It's got to be. There's got to be a bit on both sides. If it's guaranteed to be dead, it's a miserable experience. It's just so. It's just frustrating and annoying. Um, but if you're walking out, if you don't get a good lie, well, you don't get a good lie. But sometimes, if you, if half the time you get, "Oh, I can hit this one. This is fun," you know, you've got that little moment of joy in your round. You know, I don't know. There's somewhere in the middle that's right. That's right. I believe in Jeff too. You had got to provide hope and optimism somehow. Ben, I'm sure you get this all the time. You know, people have their quirky little favorites. I'm sure all three of us would like to ask you about some of our quirky little favorites. And I'll, I'll get started here with uh, Ely uh, near St. Andrews. Have you ever been there? And what do you think of it? I have. I, I can understand why James Braid enjoyed his golf there. Uh, I thought it was fun. A lot of a lot of shorter holes with a lot of character, but uh, I thought very interesting piece of property. I didn't know it that well, but I knew that he he uh, grew up there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have seen it, but I thought it was a pretty interesting collection of holes. Ely's the Periscope, of course, right? Yes. On the first team? Yeah, yeah, fantastic, yeah. Uh, Michael and I had a great match there this um, this last summer. We sneaked over during the Open at the old course. I'm afraid he closed me out like on the 17th hole, but it was, it was so much fun. Like that, that to me is the perfect kind of golf course, the Cruden Bay, the North barracks. The, it's just funky and weird and unforgettable. Um, but it's kind of like you were saying earlier, um, Jeff, about the, you know, built trying to build wing foot greens today. How do you both bring some, some whimsy and some, some fun into your designs, but not get to the point where people are going to, throw up their hands and say, oh, it's too gimmicky. Like, it's such a fine line, but how do you do that with modern golf courses? I, Jeff, I, I, you know, my first trips to the British Isles, I, I just kind of came away with the notion that there are some odd shapes on a lot of things that you see, and they, they just, this, the planners just said, well, we're going to make this part of this golf hole. I don't care what it looks like. You know, it's got a giant hill in front of you or some some something that appears out of place on the first glance. They say this is this is the situation and we're going to make a golf hole out of this. And that's why it's so, so unusual that you see so many different things. Uh, you know, I, I was disappointed. I, I love Presswick the second I saw it. But um, the uh, Himalayas hole, 
uh, not the Alps hold, but the Himalayas hold, the long par three, blind over a hill. And I thought playing the hole, it went over across the hill and it was a dead flat green, kind of a nothing green. I thought, well, God, maybe it should have been a punch bowl or something, but there was nothing to aid the golfer. You just, you drive it over this hill. That was just, that's the hole. Uh, uh, you, you saw so many different things on that course. I think it stays in your memory. I mean, you never, you never forget the Alps hole. Uh, but you you never see something like the Pal Burn on number three. You say, well, it's how that's placed, but that's that's what they do. They made a hole out of it. So it's very interesting. Uh, they didn't force it. They they used odd situations to their advantage. It gives it gives a personality to a golf hole. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. It's it's a shame golf has become so formulaic. Back then, they just they had to start in town and finish in town and they had to go that way and come back and they just used what they had, um, the little stone walls and the going over hills. I mean, the that path is incredible, right? North Berwick is just amazing. And it's so – because every hole, you, if especially the first time you've ever been there, when you go over the stone wall, is it on about the third, I think? And then you're like, well, there's a wall. What? Like, do I hit it short of the wall or past the wall? And you maybe – you walk through the middle of it and there's people having a picnic on the side of the fairway and you're just excited for the next cool thing that you're going to see really quickly because um, it's variety. It's not 18 of the same sort of thing. It's it's like, oh, what am I going to find next? And I think there's something really cool about that. You can't do it now because people would yell at you because you can't – how do we rate the course with a wall across and like the slope rating is all wrong and like it's just there's too much formula. Um it's it's nice that they still exist and we can get to go play them because we can sort of, I don't know, they set the game off in such a great direction. That's probably why the game is such a good game because it got set off in such a good direction to begin with, you know, but it's very hard to do, to replicate. You can't replicate it because you can't replicate nature, you know. That's thousands of years of farming and townspeople keeping the wrong people out, building a wall across the third fairway and then they just thought well the well, golf course has to go that way so they just went that way you know we can't move the wall that's been there for a thousand years um yeah it's uh that stuff is fantastic some of the greens are amazing like beer ritz and um stuff is people keep trying to replicate it but the original is just it's absurd but it's so good it's so fun um i don't even know how you would build it and actually make it work but um, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, Presswick too. The best part about that par three, the blind par three over the thing, there's probably there's hundreds and hundreds of people in the world who think they've had a hole in one there. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't because the cat, the, the caddies and people there will quite often see a ball come down on the green and they'll put the ball in the hole and they'll go play the next hole yeah. and they'll hear the group come around the corner and go, oh, the ball's in the hole. <laughs> um, yeah, incredible, fantastic. But that's how nice is that? That's uh, – yeah, press week. Scotland is just brilliant. Yeah, Jeff, have you had a chance to play Friars Head ever? I haven't been to Friars Head yet. No, that's that's up with my, that's on my. Have you been there, Alan? Sand hills on my wish Oh list. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. It's one of my it's favorite. Got, it's got a blind par three. <laughs> it's got no yardage markers. You know, it, it took some nerve to do it, but it shows what you can do if you're willing to get away from the group. Think of this is the way it has to be. Wouldn't that be about right, Ben? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, uh, Kenny Baxt is very persuasive and he has strong opinions, but he's done a great job. It was a great piece of property to work with, but uh, yeah, there's some unusual shapes there that we left alone. We didn't didn't try to. Uh, transfigure it in, in a lot of cases. You, you let the land speak for itself and you try to bring out its attributes uh, and let the personality stand um, and uh, try not to you try to try to avoid sameness uh, a redundancy um you want to give a little of this, a little of that. Uh, things, you know, Jeff and I have played enough golf around the world that you remember so many different things. Uh, and you, you question yourself, well, why does that work? Why did, why did that, why do people enjoy that? You know, and you question yourself wherever you're building 
uh, is you have to operate a, a, with a little restraint in saying, well, this is what this land gives us. Let's stick with that and make it part of the theme that you're trying to do. I have to, I have to share this story for, for Jeff and Michael and those who are listening. I, I was lucky to play golf with Mike Kaiser and we wound up talking about uh, Ben uh, and his design partner, Bill Kaur. And Kaiser was telling me he was so excited to go out in the field with them, you know, kind of early in, in um, the collaboration. He was just expecting to be dazzled by this really high level conversations about the design features and, and all these allusions to the great architects and the great holes. He said, and he said, uh, Bill and, and Ben, they, they kind of stand there and they, they stroke their chin and, Bottom says, you think? Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And they go on to the next hole. And it was like the whole thing, they were like communicating without words. And Kaiser said it was so boring. I, I quit going out there with them because they're on they they can communicate and they can collaborate in a way that no other two humans can. And it's so subtle. And you know, that subtlety informs those designs. But uh, anyway, I imagining you looking at, at those those great sand dunes at, at Friar's Head. I'm just picturing you and you and Bill just standing there kind of winking and nodding and moving on to the next one. There's a lot to look at there. It was unbelievable when we first saw it. There's a lot to look at. We went, wow. I knew it was going to be one of our uh, very best opportunities. Um, you know, I, I must say, I'm so lucky in my life that uh, 37 years ago, formed a partnership with Bill Coor. 37 years ago, I married Julie. So I made two really good decisions in 1985. Uh, but Bill is uh, remarkable, uh, the most patient man I've ever met. And I, he can assess a, piece, a property as good as anyone. Uh, he can look at it very quickly and understand what its properties might be. Uh, he's really good at that. And he's an excellent router. In other words, he discovers the, the directions of the holes and how they fit together. He's really, really good at that. So I've, I've been very fortunate uh, in that regard. Well, just a, another, I, I just feel compelled to add this bit. So, you know, Ben, you're you're a master's champion. You're looking for a you're looking for a design partner. Clearly, you're going to be the selling point to a lot of people. But when it comes time to name the company, Ben says, "Let's just name it Core Crenshaw." Like, put the other guy's name first, which to me says a lot about about who you are and why that collaboration has been so fruitful. Because uh, you clearly, are equals out in the field, and and uh, you defer to to him as much as he does to you. And that that's I think what a collaboration is. Well, he's he's the ideal partner. I'm just as lucky as I can be. He's he's uh, provided me with a lot of enjoyment uh, and a lot of learning. Um, and uh, if I could be as patient as he was, I'd be a better man. Uh, he's uh, it's it's meant quite a lot in my life. Uh, we've enjoyed uh, prospecting about the the uh, possibilities that we've been given and uh, we we try to bring out the best in the piece of land that we're working with that's that's all you try to do uh, uh, it's a process of, of learning uh, you learn every day in <laughs> And you, you, there's no question, you know, you, you look back and say, well, maybe we should have done this back there. And you always, you're going to question yourself wherever you go. And you, you say to yourself, sometimes, you know, you try so hard. Sometimes things turn out better than you ever thought uh, while you're doing it. You know, maybe a subtle move across a green or you know, the size of a green or size of a bunker or something. You always you always think about proportion and balance and this and that. And sometimes it doesn't come off quite like you want, but sometimes sometimes the mistakes happen, you know, in the in the plus column. So it's fascinating that way. 
Alan, to, to, to the very point you just uh, made uh, right before um, we all came on, Ben was talking about how uh, he needed uh, Elliot's help. Elliot's an assistant pro, I think, at, uh, at, at Austin, where Ben is today, or, or Julie's helped again on a, on a computer. He doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have a cell phone. And, uh, you know, of course, it's a little bit of a joke, but it, I mean, it's not a joke because it, because it's true. But in this day and age, it kind of sounds like one. But really, I think it's the essence of of Ben as a person and as a, as an architect. Um, and I think to really be an, an artist on the golf course or in golf course architecture. And I think Jeff is, is similarly built. I know this is a cliche, even the phrase, but you really have to be in that moment. And in our modern lives, that is so much harder to do than it's ever been before because we're bombarded with these messages all the time. And, uh, you know, if I think about a hero of mine like like Herb Wynn writing about uh, Ben Crenshaw, I could imagine Herb and Ben just talking and Ben trying, excuse me, Herb trying to absorb Ben's life and then explain it and show it uh, to readers. And um, it's just a treat for us, I think, Alan, I'm sure I'm speaking for you and I imagine I'm speaking for Jeff too, just to be able to hear someone who's so thoughtful about the game uh, this year at uh, at the memorial tournament uh, ben was honored by big jack uh, as the uh, i'm not sure the exact term but the memorial honoree of the year and ben didn't have notes he just talked about the game without notes because it's so deep within him he doesn't need any notes and he doesn't need any prompts he doesn't need any anything he doesn't need to look up anything it's in him uh and um you know that this conversation could go on probably until tomorrow and we'd never get tired. We haven't even had Jeff had a chance to ask Ben about fiddly little Ely type courses in Australia that he knows that Ben probably knows too. But anyway, just thought I might share. That. I just want to ask, uh, how, do, how do I hold more parts? Honestly, <laughs> um, when, <laughs> when you clearly, well, one of the best putters we've ever seen. Um, when you, but you obviously had some bad times. How did you? What went wrong when you weren't making putts, and how did you fix it? Did you? I mean, because all we see now is mirrors and lines and circles around the hole and stuff. And I'm pretty sure that that wasn't you when you when yours wasn't going well um, on the putting green. Uh, what did you Jeff, do? Yeah, uh, I know this that when I putted my best. I was thinking of absolutely nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. But I focused in on how hard I was going to hit it and where the where the line was. Most oftentimes, how hard I was going to hit it. So I was trying to rely on imagination and where I just pictured the ball. Just I made it a vivid picture of how that was going to roll. And the times I got in trouble, every time a mechanical thought crept in there. I was worried about the path of my stroke or whether whether my grip pressure was just right. In other words, when I putted my best, I had a blank mind. And that may sound really strange, but uh, I always remember a line that Bobby Jones wrote in uh, Bobby Jones on Golf, which I still think is the most brilliant book about instruction. But he, he wrote... Uh, he said, if anyone uh, reduces putting to mechanical or uh, precise thoughts in that way, he said, you are doomed for disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and he said the whole the ability to gauge a slope uh, or the, the, the speed of a putt you're much better. But uh, I thought, well, God, if it was good enough for the most cerebral golfer that ever lived, that's worth worth looking after. So I, it's, it's weird. I, 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 when I've made putts, I, I just picture it, and it comes off, and I didn't have any sort of thought about length of backswing or anything. It's just very strange that way. I love that. I mean, I'll go work on that then. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also Ben, I mean, I remember talking um, 
to Luke Donald, who was also obviously a great putter. And he was talking about your stroke and he said, you know, I'm not sure you would teach people to putt like Ben Crenshaw because it wasn't the same stroke every time. Sometimes it looked like on the fast downhill, he was going to try and slice a little bit. And and sometimes he would take a, a long backswing and sometimes it was short. Like he was not, the, he did not have a, the, the same stroke repeat over and over. It was very situational. Yeah, and is that part of what you're saying? It just, just off the toe to deaden the body. It's just, yeah. Jeff and I'll try anything to make a putt. You know, that's, that's <laughs> and it, it's, it's a, and let's face it, you know, I forgot who, who said it. The, close, the closer you get to the hole, the more difficult the game becomes when, when you think of it. It's a strange – putting is completely – that's why Mr. Hogan really didn't regard part of the game. He loved hitting balls and he could do it. But he, he just – he didn't disregard putting, but he, he, he thought it was a part of the game that, was, that should have left – uh, less attention, let's say. Ben, isn't there sort of a shift as you get closer to the hole? When you're, when you're far away from the hole, there's a lot of good things that can happen. And then when you get closer to the hole, there's only bad things that can happen. Yeah, uh, the, more <laughs> mental, the more mental it becomes. And, uh, you know, the, you, you try real hard to say to yourself, well, look, it's you got to hit the ball solid and you got to stay down and you've picked the right line and the right pace. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. Michael, do you remember the first time you ever saw Ben Crenshaw on a golf course? Well, I do for sure. And uh, uh, I mean, definitely on TV, That certainly that, that 75 uh, U.S. Open stands out. And then uh, Ben mentioned 85 uh, earlier, but I, I caddied in quite a few uh, PGA tournaments in 85. I remember the caddy saying, you know, when, when Ben putts well, it's like, well, how does this guy not win every week? And the answer was, well, he can't play a course well that he doesn't like. That's what the, that was the caddy art <laughs> joke back then. <laughs> no, I'll tell you one of the most comforting, you know, I, I'm not kidding you. I felt like I've always had the best caddy at Augusta for all my years in Carl Jackson. I mean, he was, we worked together so well, but we saw, saw things in unison. So we'd look at a pot. And he'd say, what do you like? And I said, I, you know, right out here. And he would look at me and he'd say, we're together. And I, I said, man, I'm on the right track. So he gave me a lot of confidence before I hit the ball. But we had so much fun uh, <coughs> working out putts and watching other people putt when we were in play. We'd, we'd read their putts. It was really <laughs> fun. But, man, I, I mean, I, I – that guy helped me so much. It was unbelievable. So much. Okay, he grew up He grew up caddying there, and he had his first – he caddied in the tournament when he was 14 years old, which is unbelievable. And it was Billy Burke, the guy who won the 1931 U.S. Open. Uh, and he, he, he said he played in a starch white shirt and a tie every day. But that was his first job at Augusta. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I mean, it's one of those themes that runs through your golfing life, Ben, is these uh, these friendships you've had, whether it's Carl Jackson or it's Bill Cor or it's Byron Nelson. And I think now a lot of people know you're you're the uh, the host of the Tuesday Night Champions Dinner at Augusta National and I mean, you tell me one time you get more nervous about that than any golf shot you have to hit. And, but um, I never know what the hell I'm going to say to them. You're standing there in front of all these guys you admire, and you know it's a dinner that we've all you've all won, and it's just I, I, I just I start I try to just start it off and let them have fun. That's the best way. We're all we're all lucky to be there. Really lucky to be there. Ben, I know this would be hard to articulate. Um, but it's such a one of the great moving moments in the history of golf, certainly for for you know of our generation, was Carl comforting you when you when you won that Masters uh, shortly after burying burying Harvey. Can is there any way you can express the humanity he showed to you? Carl showed to you at that moment because it's such it, it's such a rich moment of you know he. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it, but I'll what, maybe you can take over for me. I, it's, uh, we were together so long. Um, 
and and that had happened on that occasion is still I still daydream about it these these days. I can't. It's hard to believe that it happened in the way that it did. But uh, I, you know, after being exhausted and I got through it, I felt these big arms around me, and uh, he said, "Buddy, are you okay?" And I went, "No, I'm not. <laughs> I was just overcome." But it was a friend helping me at that at that moment. I needed help. I really did. Uh, but it was part and parcel of the things that we we learned to play that course together. We had some great times and we had some near misses. But uh, I felt like I had a guy who really helped me considerably. He made me learn the golf course. Uh, but it was a at that moment, it was a, it was a friend to a friend. Uh, he'll always be my friend, and uh, very very kind man. Well, people ask me sometimes, what's the, you know, what's your favorite story you've ever done? And I often mention, you know, for the 25th anniversary of that victory, I went to Austin, and uh, Ben and Julie very graciously welcomed me into their home, and we queued up the videotape of the final round, and we watched it together, and. Uh, you know, Julie's crying, Ben's crying, I'm crying. And uh, they, they had, it sounds like you guys hadn't watched it in a long time. And it's just, it's like, uh, I think you, in the story, you called it like a fairy tale. Like, it's just amazing that it all played out the way it did. And that's the magic of sports and Augusta National. It just, it's, it's it somehow these stories come together and they're, they're so cinematic, but it actually happened. You actually did it. And it, it's one of the great moments ever in golf. Oh, it, it well. It's, uh, I've been luckier than most and I'm, I'm very, very much a softy. And I've, I've told many people that said, look, I cry at supermarket openings. <laughs> <laughs> it was also when, when, when Ben won the, in 95, there was an amazing three year period for the masters with Ben's win and then Faldo's win and then Tiger's win all three in a row there. And, uh, you know, for a whole generation, Jeff would have been part of that generation, just coming of age and catching those. It would be like me catching that 75 U.S. Open or the 74 U.S. Open at, at, at Wingfoot. Uh, just a magical period to fall in love with the game. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to tune in and I think it's next week to watch Father Son. I can't wait to watch Charlie, Tiger's son. And, I, you know, last year I was watching that. Not only he can play, but he had, it's like he had a single minded purpose the way that he held those putts, you know, under pressure. It was like it was nothing. And I'm going, well, this, this is pretty good. He's got a pretty good teacher and his father, but he was just doing it. And I'm going, wow, this is, I can't wait to watch it. Uh, and I think a lot of people are going to watch it, but, uh, uh, I, it, uh, you know, you really look back at Tiger's career and you, yeah, he's unbelievable, but the mental toughness that he displayed in for decades, you know, there was no, uh, more competitive person, uh, a winner, you know, every time he had the lead, he won. Uh, but I think his mind, you know, there are very, very few, people who accomplish things in the game and you think about their mental capacities and you look at Bobby Jones and Jack Nicklaus uh, and all these great players, they have a, they have a very competitive side, but they have a mental side that a lot of people don't approach. Uh, he had it. My God, Tigers had it. Well, I mean, you're, you're what, 60 years older than, than, than Charlie Woods, but you're linked by that same quest just to make more putts and just the, the magic of the game. I mean, it transcends it all. So, oh my gosh, cool. got a good swing too. He's going to grow and hit that ball well. I'm kind of fascinated by that. Well, Ben, you've been incredibly generous with your time. I feel like we sh we should let you go because Michael's right. We could do this deep into the night. I don't think anyone would mind except for our kids and wives and dogs. Or 
um, waiting for us to end this podcast. But um, any Michael or Jeff, any, any last thoughts or questions for for Ben before we, we let him go? No, nah, it's always good to chat, Ben. You're uh, you you view golf in a way that I really enjoy. Um, so yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Jeff. And I've always thought that you, I've always enjoyed how you uh, depict things about the game and not only as a player, but how people look at the game and how they look at courses. And uh, you're, you're doing it. Uh, you're building courses. And uh, I've, I've always admired you. Like I said earlier, anybody who can handle wing foot is a tough customer. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. I always enjoy watching you and, and, and listening to you. And you two guys, Alan and Michael, great to talk to you. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk to you both. And uh, y'all great, have great holidays. We're, we're, we're coming around to part of the year where, where families get together. We enjoy. We're, we're lucky to be alive. <laughs> Thank you both very much. All right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Oh, my God. There's a dangerous group here. 